wife's soul to pray for her. All right, Dave. Come on. Thank you, Father, that you're here this morning. God, I just pray for your spirit just to be so evident in this room, God. God, help us just to receive specifically each individual through Debbie what you have for us, Father. Just give her a refreshing as she speaks, God. Just help her to be refreshed each word, God. Help her to just build upon that. And we just invite you here today, Father, and your glory be risen here in this room here today, God. That your kingdom could be established, Father. We just praise you. We just want to glorify you in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, Mike. Is it working? Okay, I think it's working. I'm going to take this beautiful lay off just so I can give you my full attention and put it right here. Okay, and then I'm going to turn the fan off too. Did I do that right? How does the fan go off? Whoa, whoa. What did I do? Awesome. There we go. Sorry. Thank you, guys. Well, it's been 10 years since I've come to Kona. It's a completely different base. Yeah, it's a totally different base. And so I took a walk last night, and I just kept walking and walking, thinking, when is this base going to end? Because it ended when these white buildings are. That's where I used to always stand every morning at 5 o'clock and pray. Yeah, and so I went to my old prayer place, and I thought, I'm going to, 10 years, God's brought me back. I'm going to go back, and I, it was gone. <laughs> there used to be this wonderful rock that I used to stand on top of, and it's gone. The rock is gone, <laughs> but it's okay. Well, uh, I've been thinking about you guys for about, I don't know, a good three months, two and at two months, and I actually have an uh, uh, entire group of people praying for you guys as they pray for me. So hopefully this week will be, um, what I ask them to pray is, some of the things that I really want to take you guys through is reestablishing identity. And that sounds like a really kind of a simple topic, but it's really spiritual warfare because what ends up happening is, is that through scripture, I have to kind of go into areas of your life and begin to really try to rework worldview, understanding of your own self, understanding of community. And to do that, sometimes we have to go in and reverse a lot of untruths. And that really is spiritual warfare. So that's why I kept asking anybody and everybody that I know who are, who are prayer people to be praying for us this week because you and I have to really learn to communicate, right? And so I am fearfully and prayerfully going to try to take you through these very large books. There is a ton of theology, especially the book of Genesis. Uh, Job is considered the crown jewel of the Bible. So it's beautiful poetry, but it's also incredible theology that's in there. So we're going to go through some really tough things, but I'm going to try to te teach and share with you guys in the most simple most understandable way, because that's why I feel the scripture uh, should be taught and learned. So, really excited. Just to give you a really brief uh, kind of introduction, I know Andrew gave a, a wonderful introduction. I was born in Korea back in mid-70s, and uh, moved to the States when it was 1980. That was when President Reagan became president, John Lennon was assassinated, it was the, okay, so anyway, back in 80. And uh, brought up in LA. So most of my life I lived in LA. Who's from LA? Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. Are you from LA, Stephen? Okay, you, okay, great. So he just loves the Bible and he loves LA. That's yeah. So uh, went to university, went to a local school, UCLA. Anybody UCLA? Woo woo. No, okay. All right. And then uh, joined YWAM when 2000. Five, I was 31, was in a really kind of a funky place in life, uh, had fallen into a lot of depression uh, because I was really kind of disappointed with my own spiritual walk. Like, is this all there is to believe in God? And I had fallen into such deep depression that my doctor actually said I was clinically depressed and wanted to put me on meds. 
And so uh, somebody had told me about YWAM. Uh, I, I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna take a five month break. So I went to my boss, told her I'm quitting. I really like you, I love, love my job, but I'm quitting. And a week later, she came with a check for $10,000, wow. dropped me 10 grand to send me to Kona. So she paid for my school fees, my outreach. So I came to DTS debt free, and that's when I really knew that that was God pushing me into a very different life. Uh, moved back to the States three years ago because my mom was diagnosed with lymphoma. And in 2012, she passed away. She was my life mentor. She was my prayer warrior. And to lose her was very, very difficult. And so I'm gonna bring a lot of the things and I'm getting feedback. Sorry, is it me? It's me? Okay, awesome. So a lot of that I'm gonna bring back into my teaching in Job. Because uh, Job really is a book about human suffering. So with all that, I really wish I could have gotten to know everybody's names. I like to kind of know everyone before, but I'll, I'll spend this week really getting to know you guys, okay? All right, so let's just go straight into it. So you guys have come to DBS. Uh, some of you are, have, are in DBS because you don't want to do an SBS. It's too intimidating. <laughs> totally hear you. It was the most difficult. After I did SBS, I went to seminary, and I'm like, what the heck is this? So easy. <laughs> I, I'm not joking. It's like 12 hours of studying the Bible every day for nine months, and you get like one day off, and you don't even take that one day because you're like, oh my God, I need to get my work done. <laughs> right? <laughs> So I am so glad. I was asking Yo last night as he was picking me up from the airport, you know, what, what inspired you to create this program? What, what do you feel God was putting on your heart? And he just basically said that he wants everybody to be equipped with the Bible. If you can't do an SBS, he wants you to be equipped with the worldview of the Bible so that the Bible becomes a lens through which you see the world and you see one another and you see yourself, right? So I am a full proponent of this program. I'm gonna to try to give you my all this week, okay? So the Bible. Okay, all 66 books, maybe about 40 authors, depending on who you talk to. What is the Bible, right? I mean, you've got different kinds of stories in there. You've got books like Genesis, it's just all stories. Then you've got books like Psalms, which is just all poetry. And then you have books like Revelation, which is something called the apocalyptic writings, and it's like weird symbols and dragons, and right? So there's a lot of different genres, right? Types of writings. And then you have about 40 writers, which is incredible because when you look at the writings of each 40 writers, it's incredible how unified the message is. The symbols are very, very unified. The message, the usage of the messianic image, it's very similar throughout the entire Bible. And yet, as you study the Bible, you're gonna to start to see that there are slight discrepancies. Like, oh, this doesn't seem to kind of coincide with this. There's, you know, one person seems to be saying this, another person seems to be saying this. What I'm gonna to propose to you, and you guys can accept or reject, okay? Whatever I say, you always have the choice to accept or reject, okay? I'm not a cult leader. I'm not going to tell you that everything is 100% true, right? Because we are, the, the base foundation we have to lay down is we are all heretics to some degree. Okay, we all carry heresy to some degree. Okay, if anybody says to you that you have 100% theology, that my theology is 100% right, okay, that's heresy, okay? So I'm going to propose it to you. You get to choose for yourself. That's why you're the, in the made of the image of God, right? You have a choice to accept or reject, okay? And I personally will not be offended if you reject, okay? It's okay. I, what I do is not who I am, okay? So what I'm going to propose is that the 40 writers in the 66 books of the Bible are arrows. Everybody point at me. I'm serious. Point a finger at me. Do you see how all the fingers are pointing in different directions? Right? And you can put your finger down. Wow, it's so accusatory. <laughs> okay. So what it is is God is something called transcendent. He's so big. Right? And human language is not as structured and limitless as we think it is. Okay, I know that was just a philosophical statement, but whenever human language is so limited, right? Whenever it hits its limit, right? 
that's when God stops to make sense. Right? Like, oh. Uh, and it's because we don't know how to describe God. And so that's why you have 40 authors in 66 ways trying to describe God. Who are you, God? What do you love? What do you hate? Right? What do you think of me? What do you think of this world? Is 66 different ways of trying to ex explain and express this very unexpressible God. Right? So that's why things may look like contradictions, but they're really telling a very synchronized story. And it's about like the, the story of the blind man trying to feel an, an elephant, trying to describe an elephant. You know that story, have you ever heard it? Everybody gives a different description, right? But together it, still, it tells a synchronized story, right? And the, one of the main things that I'm going to try to really push very hard on you guys, right, during Genesis, if you guys are ever wondering, what is G Debbie trying to teach me in Genesis? The main thrust that I'm going to try to push on you is that we are all on a journey of discovery. See, the Bible, right? Who's, who's read the Bible cover to cover? Good. Who's read it 10 times? Who's read it 20 times? OK, the only people are the people sitting in the back, right? <laughs> The more you read it, the more you'll know, the more you'll discover. Why? Because you're on a journey. Everybody's on a journey. Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, they're all on a journey. Moses, that's what I really want you guys to understand. You're on a journey too, right? And I'll really begin to kind of unravel what that really means, and I'm getting feedback again. It's probably because where I'm standing, right? All right, so let's get into the book. What I'm going to do, hour one, is I'm going to try to give you some general background. I know that that's part of your written assignment. I was looking through your uh, booklet last night. So I'm going to try to give you some background uh, information on authorship, on when written, kind of the, the cultural background. And that'll really be the foundation for hour two, which is I'm going to talk about the creation narrative. And some of you guys won't like my creation narrative teaching because I don't talk science. I think that really detracts from the message of Genesis. So I don't talk science. Ah, Stephen's happy. OK. And the third hour, we're going to end with a really happy note. We're going to talk about the flood. <laughs> the destruction of the entire world. Awesome. OK. So we'll end on a good note, OK? All right. So in order to talk about Genesis, can people on this side of the room see this? Should I turn the screen a little? OK. Tell me and I can move. So the book of Genesis, in order to understand it, you've got to read the other book at the very end. This is the beginning. We have to compare it with the end, right? Wow. The book of Genesis is where what? Sin begins. And we're going to talk about sin. And the book of Revelation is where what? Sin ends. I will email this PowerPoint to you so you don't have to freak out with taking pictures, OK? <laughs> So in Genesis, what? The serpent deceives humankind. But in Revelation, what happens to the serpent, right? It's destroyed. In Genesis, we eat. Humanity eats from the tree of knowledge. And in Revelation, we eat from the tree of life. Do you see the parallel that's going on? Yeah. I mean, it was written by Moses, and the other one was written by Apostle John. In Genesis is where suffering and injustice begins. And that's going to be a big word that I'm going to use, injustice. In Revelation, it's where justice and the end of suffering. There will be no more tears in heaven, right? And in Genesis, is where death begins to reign. When you read the genealogy in chapter 5 of Genesis, he died, he died, and he died, and he died. And in Revelation, life reigns, right? You know, Jesus will be the son. You will need no temple. And in Genesis, the really sad thing that happens, this is the saddest part, is that man and woman begin to move away from God. Whereas in Revelation, God promises, what? That he will be with us. And that is an incredible promise throughout all of the Bible. You know, the, the, if you ever see me walking across campus doing this, right? I'm asking four words, right? Four words. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Is what I feel God is asking me. Do you trust me? Do you trust me with your family? Do you trust me with your life? Do you trust me with your future? And then if you see me doing this with my other hand, it's, 
I trust you, God. I trust you, God. And that's the question of the Bible. I'm serious. Every single book you read, the question is, raise your right hand, and you start to say, do you trust me? If you can keep that question in mind as you read the Bible, you'll read it a lot better. I promise. So the type of writing, Genesis, right? It's a lot of stories. Now with stories, we have to be careful because stories often will not teach you what to do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Right? A story is just telling a story. So Abraham takes Hagar to be his second wife. So is the Bible now teaching all the men in this room to go out and get a second wife? Right? That's not what the Bible's teaching. It's telling a story, right? Right? Uh, Isaac, okay, let's, okay, there isn't very much written about Isaac. Jacob goes in and he just lies to his dad and steals his sibling's blessing. This is, what, this is not what God is teaching, yeah. right? So we have to remember that, that when you're reading a story, you're, you are being given a kind of a scenario and you're supposed to be able to discern who is God and who am I? And, and in order to do that, in order to know who am I, you have to understand who the, what, original hearers and the original readers are, right? That's why I give you cultural context. I am going to try to give you as much of the original hearer and reader's mindset as I can. This is a very difficult thing to do, but I'm going to do my best, okay? So you just have to track with me. All right. <clears throat> the way that Genesis is structured is by this one, it's a, it's a Hebrew word. I think it's fairly important, so I'm just going to write it on the board, pretend like I'm a real teacher. Because I am. All right, this is Hebrew word, kotoladot. Obviously, that's an English transliteration. But that word, it means generations. Okay, and you're like, what does that have to do with anything, right? Generations. Okay. So, the, the way that, if you ever do a, an SBS, you know, write this down, because you're going to need this. <laughs> if you ever do an SBS, this is going to be your main break. So, the first 11 chapters are going to be incredibly dense. Okay, it's a very, very dense chapter. People have written volumes and volumes just on chapters one to three. Okay, so you can only imagine how many ch books have been written just on the first 11 chapters. It's really about the history of the world, history of the ancient world. Okay, the creation of the world, the flood, the Tower of Babel. And then the next section is chapters 12 to 50 and it's gonna concentrate on five people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and Joseph. Okay? People always leave out Judah, but he's important. <laughs> okay, so Judah and Joseph. So it's going to be that. And the way that the book is divided, every time when you're going through, you only have, what, 14 chapters left to read. When you're going, oh, actually, you don't get it towards the end. Okay, you should have read. It says, and these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And these are the generations of Abraham. And these are the generations of Isaac. It's that word toledos. Okay? And we're going to come back to it. It's a very important <coughs> word. It means generations, right? Does anybody have questions so far? I'm like so excited. I want to move you through all of it, but I realize I'm taking too much time. All right, let's talk about authorship. Now, has anybody ever studied the JDP World Housing Theory? Okay, so I don't have to talk too much about it. Aaron has. Where'd you study it? Um, uh, Gordon Combo. Oh, so you went to Gordon? Just a little, yeah. Okay, awesome, awesome. A lot of YWAMers at Gordon right now. There's more there than Oh yeah, that is a ton, that's a ton. Fuller's got some YWAMers, hey, yeah. come on over our way. Anyway, 
Okay, so I will not talk about the JDP theory. It's very highly controversial. I'm just going to give you the mosaic authorship because that's what I believe. <laughs> like I said, if you want to learn something more, you can, you're free to come and talk to me at the break or grab me at lunch or coffee or something. Okay? The reason I say Moses wrote this book is because this is what Deuteronomy says. Okay? Deuteronomy says, Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Now the law here can either refer to the entire Pentateuch, Gen uh, Genesis to uh, Deuteronomy. It can also just refer to the book of Deuteronomy. It can also refer just to the Ten Commandments. But whatever it is, Moses wrote it. Now Moses is specifically qualified for this. Why? Does anybody remember, remember from Acts? Has anybody ever read Acts? What does it say? Your uh, name is? My name is Christopher. Christer? Oh, wow. That's awesome. Uh, You're like a Christ, but er. You do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, you do Christ? Yes. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> Christer. Yes, sorry. Uh, basically, he was a man of good speech and high education. Yes, that's right. It says that Moses was educated in the knowledge of Egypt. Mm. Okay? So, Egypt is a very high, it's a very civilized, very developed country. And so Moses was specifically qualified to be the leader of Israel. One of the reasons, minor reasons, is that he could actually read and write. Mm -hmm. So he was the only person able to write scripture. So this is what Deuteronomy says. Not just in Deuteronomy, all throughout scripture, the Bible attributes authorship of the Pentateuch to Moses. Okay? Another thing that qualifies Moses is once you start reading, um, especially when you get to Joseph, you'll start reading that whoever wrote this had a high familiarity with Egypt. They knew the embalming rules, right? They knew the separation rules uh, that Egyptians didn't eat with shepherds. You're going to read that later on when you get to Joseph, right? So whoever, he talks about the lands, talks about the topography, right? Mountains and valleys and, you know? So whoever wrote it had a very, very good familiarity with Egypt. To me, it sounds like Moses, right? And then Jesus in the New Testament says, did Moses not teach you? So if Jesus says, then I'm going to be okay. Whatever Jesus says. Jesus says, Moses wrote it. Moses wrote it. All right. Questions on authorship. This book, I was going through it last night. This is such a good book. I'm going to go buy it when I go home. I really, really, I was just like, wow, why, where was this when I was doing my SBS? But anyway. <laughs> So, it would have made life so easy if I had this, but anyway, okay. So let's go on to date written. I'm going to try to move through this really quickly so we can actually get into the meat, okay? So when was the book written? If you have your Bibles, I have a different version. I'm using ESV, so my apologies, it's going to be a different reading. But let's turn to 1 Kings. 1 Kings is after 1 Samuel, 1 and 2 Samuel. 1 Kings 6 1. Yes. Yes. 436. 436. You're going to love 1 Kings. It's so crazy. <laughs> Such a crazy book. Crazy people. All right. So, apologies again. I'm going to have a different version. Okay, so let's read it. It says, how about you guys all read it for me? How about that, okay? All right, here we go. One, two, three. Okay, wow, it's very different from my version. So it says, let's do the math, okay? I am terrible at math, but this I can do. It's just addition, subtraction. So it says in the fourth year, Solomon began to build the temple. Okay, you're going to ask me, how do you know that number? Historically, we know that in 966, Solomon began to build the temple, okay? So it's not in the Bible. It's historic. Um, oh, oops, this is kind of flipped, sorry. Solomon begins to build a temple here. My bad, this is flipped, okay? 
and it's 480 years. Do you get it? Right? So 480 years after the Exodus. So the Exodus is dated to 1446. Does that make sense? Okay. Whew. Usually I'm so bad at math that I don't know if I get this right. So the 40 years that they wander in the wilderness is dated sometime around 1406 they enter into Canaan. Okay, so this is going to be your base dating. Some people agree, some people disagree, but generally this is the kind of dating for the book. So when was the book of Genesis to Deuteronomy written, the five books of the Pentateuch? You guys know what penta means, right? It means five. Okay, so that's why it's called Pentateuch. So it's written somewhere in between 1446 to 1406. And it's pretty much completed by 1406 because Moses actually reads the book of Deuteronomy to the people before they enter into the Promised Land. So it's pretty safe to say that it was written, most likely, completed before 1406. Questions? I really like questions, so please feel free. It's really simple. What does Tuk mean? Tuk? Tuk, I think... It, is that what it means? I thought it was the teachings, but probably you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I will look that up for you in my Greek dictionary and get back to you. Is it? What does it mean? Wow, you guys are awesome. You guys actually read the book. This is fantastic. It means volume. Volumes. Okay. I was going to say teachings, but volumes. All right. So we're good on the dating? All right. So you so good. Oh, good. All right. Awesome. Now the word Genesis. Okay, this is, a, this is a Greek word that was translated into English. What do the Jews, the Hebrews, call the book of Genesis? They call it Bereshit or Bereshit, Bereshith. It, Hebrew is a little fluid. It's, it's hard to pronounce things. They don't have any vowels. So it's just a bunch of, bunch of consonants. Okay, now... The, he the Jews, when they named the first five books of the, uh, the Pentateuch, it was whatever are the first words of the book, that's the name of the book. So in Genesis, this book is actually called to the, the Jews, it's called In the Beginning. So we would say, okay, everyone, turn to the first section of In the Beginning, right? Uh, Leviticus is, I think, the, I think it's Leviticus, the first words of Leviticus was, and God called to Moses, or, and God kept calling to Moses, depending on how you understand the verb, right? So the name of this book is the Hebrew word Bereshith. I pronounce it as if it's a sheet, Bereshith. Isn't that cool? I love Hebrew. <laughs> I love Hebrew. Anyway, let's go into a little bit of kind of worldview. I'm going to try to I'm going to do my best. I pray the Holy Spirit impart to you what I'm trying to give to you. Let's do a little bit of um, historical background, okay? The way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to talk to you about the two major uh, realms of ancient Near East religion, okay? And hopefully this will give you a mindset in understanding the original readers and the, specifically the original hearers as well as, more importantly, the, the uh, original readers. So you guys all know Egypt, right? So you'll notice a lot of things on this painting. I think that might be Hatshepsut, but I, I'm not quite sure. Sorry, it has Chinese, because, <laughs> because this slide I use when I teach in Taiwan. <laughs> so that's why. I put it here so that when it was translated into Korean, they would know where to put it. But unfortunately, it didn't come through. But that's cool, too. All right, so you'll notice a lot of things. You'll notice a lot of animals, right? You'll see an animal on top of uh, her head. You'll see that round circle is most likely the sun, uh, the sun, right? And then the horns that are coming out of her head, right? It's just the funkiest thing, right? The horns have incredible meaning in the old ancient world. So you'll read a lot of horns in Revelation. Horns usually, this was probably symbolic of the cow of Hathor, right? So these are all powers, uh, symbols of power, okay? And this lady has, uh, what, feathers. She's a bird, right? And then she has a, a feather on her head, and that's going to have meaning when you're talking about hell. Well, not hell, when, about the afterlife. So when, they, when the Egyptians looked at nature, 
what did they actually see? They didn't see trees. We look at nature and think, oh, that's beautiful, like the Grand Canyon. Have you, who's been to the Grand Canyon? You're like, wow, jaw drop, right? I actually like Bryce and Zion better than Grand Canyon, right? But anyway, who cares? So when they looked at nature, they actually saw gods that controlled nature, right? So they didn't just look at the Nile River. This is Hapi, cool name, right? So Hapi, <laughs> yeah, okay. He is the one that controls the fertility of the Nile. He controls the yearly flood. Egypt has never been in famine simply because they have the Nile River. It was able to become one of the wealthiest nations in that time because of the Nile. So Hapi is a very, very important guy. You gotta keep Hapi happy. And I, I just made that up. That was pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. And this is Ra. This is what version of Ra. Okay, so you'll notice Ra's head looks like a bird, right? So the Egyptians like to kind of really mix human and nature and animals. It's kind of like this real symbiotic kind of... And so this is Ra. Ra is very similar to the Greek or the Roman Apollo. He would, get in, he would get in his chariot, ride in the morning, rise in the east, ride across the sky, you know, the, the journey of the sun across the sky, and then he would set in the west, right? So you gotta keep Ra happy, because Ra makes everything happen, right? Crops, the moon is reflected in the sun, so Ra is a very important god. Who's this? This is Anubis. This is a really interesting painting. Anubis, you could tell his head is a jackal. Okay? Anubis is not the god of death, but he kind of was the doorway to the afterlife. Okay? What he's doing here is, this is a feather, just like the one that was on the lady's head, right? And this is the person's heart. And it was often just the pharaoh, or one of the leaders of Egypt. When they go into the afterlife, what would happen is, their heart would be put on a scale, and it would be measured against the feather. And if the heart was pure, right, it would balance out and the, the pharaoh was worthy to enter into the afterlife, right? And this only happened for the pharaoh. All the common people, I mean this develops later on into, in Egyptian mythology, becomes different, but originally all, all you people here in this room, you guys would just kind of go into a gray existence, just a gray life. You didn't get to do this, right? This is just for the pharaoh. What do I want to say about Egyptian religion? Now, remember, Israel is in Egypt for 430 years, and it's influenced by this worldview, okay? In this worldview, I show you the pyramid because this is, when you think of Egypt, this is one of the first things you think, right? These are monuments to death, okay? It's a four-sided pyramid, so it's a square base, and then it's four, Four base usually means the world. The number four always means the world. And so it's their dominance over the world and then it's pointing up to their godhood, right? All sides of the world point up to their godhood. So they have an incredible fascination with death. They didn't actually believe that death was a bad thing. It was, they just believed that it was progression into the next life, into the afterlife. And only, and everybody, the pyramid system is really interesting. I'm gonna show you a video, uh, video on this tomorrow, but the pyramid basically meant that the whole world was meant to support who? Pharaoh, right? So who's the most important person? And everyone else? You're all slaves. And your life and your meaning and your existence was for the purpose of supporting Pharaoh. And it was for the purpose of supporting him so that he could live well in the next life because Pharaoh himself was a god. He was a demigod. Right? So what kind of value do humans have? Not very much. You don't have very much value at all, right? Any questions on? I'm going to show you one more picture. This is the Sphinx. He has no nose because Napoleon went and he did shooting practice on the nose, all his soldiers. Wow. Can you believe this? They went to a world monument and shot off the nose. Napoleon is crazy. <laughs> You know Napoleon was only like 5'2"? Yeah, he was a really short man. Do you know Hitler was really short too? Do you know Alexander the Great was really short too? There's something about short men and conquering the world. Maybe Jesus was short too, who knows? 
hey, you don't know, all right? You're going to be so surprised when you see Jesus. You're like, wow, you're nothing like what I thought you'd look like. All right, let's talk a little bit about Mesopotamian religion. Now, the Mesopotamian religion, these are the two large empires. It's the Babylonian Empire and then the Egyptian Empire. They're in power at slightly different times, but they're very important powers. And the reason that they're powerful, they're... You, in the ancient world, you can't separate religion from politics and economics. Everything. The king is king because it's religious, because it's political. Right? Now, I say that to you, but because we don't come from that system, it doesn't really register into our minds. So I'm going to try to pump it as much as I can into your brains, okay? The reason we study religion is because it really does give us a worldview, right? Into why we make daily choices, how we treat our neighbors, you know. So that's why religion and, and these, these things are very, very highly important. So this is the Mesopotamian Empire, huge, right? And this is most likely where Abraham was raised, Ur. So he comes from a Mesopotamian background. He's not actually a Jew. He's the first Jew, technically but he's actually Mesopotamian, he's Babylonian, right? So he possibly comes from this area. Some people like to place him up here. Yeah. Mesopotamia is one of the most advanced cultures of that time. Do you know, this is just a side note, do you know Egyptian, the coffins? I was watching this special on uh, Egypt. I have a huge fascination for Egypt and Israel, Babylon. Uh, they, when they built the um, you know the Tutankhamun's, the sarcophagus, where they laid the body? The gold was polished, but the gold was so fine that they, when they first found it, they were trying to polish it. They took the finest cloth that they could find and it would still scratch it. So then they had to take it into a clean room and then blow wind on a clean room. You know what a clean room is, right? They purify the air, get all the dust and the dirt out of the air, and then they blew wind on it and it still scratched it. So they still, to this day, don't know how the Egyptians polish their gold like this. Yeah, it's fascinating. So when I say that the ancient world was incredibly com complex and sophisticated, they discovered things like telescopes and created geometry. Right? You just learn it in school, but they actually created it. They created numbers. Like, how do you do that? They discovered zero, the Arabs, right? You can't do math without zero. So when I say that this culture was incredibly advanced, that's what I mean, right? And their religion was so tied into that. They believed that they received all of these things from the gods, right? So this is Nergal. You will, whenever you look up Assyria or Babylon, this is the most famous image that you'll get. What do you see again? Do you see how the humans and animals are being morphed? Right? Here's this Mesopotamian, he has the beard, so it means he's a king of some kind, right? It's a kingly figure. And then he's got a body of a lion, and then he's got the wings of an eagle. So do you see the morphing of animals in nature? We'll see another creature, this is a really cute one. Ea, the god of earth and waters. Don't you think it's so cute? I think it's cute, whatever. <coughs> Looks like a stick figure. I'm not quite sure what they're doing. I should have researched this a little bit more. This is Marduk. So when you guys read Genesis, when you read about the flood, when you read about creation, we would often like to think that Christians have, like we have a hegemony on, we have a, we have a what's the word? We have a stronghold on the creation narrative, like this is ours and nobody has anything like it similar to ours, right? Okay, this is not true. The ancient Near East people have many stories like this, different cultures. They will call it the flood story, they will call it the Gilgamesh epic. Very, very similar to the Noah story. Ah, see, this is disturbing to some of you guys. You're like, what? You just destroyed my <laughs> belief in the Old Testament. No, it's not true, don't worry. They also have lots of creation narratives that are very similar to our Genesis narrative, right? But let me tell you one really quickly. It's called Enuma Elish, right? Okay, so I didn't read it in the original language. I read it in translation. You guys can actually find a free copy online. Enuma Elish. Uh, basically, the story is, is there's a, 
uh, a ruler king, his name is Apsu, he gives birth to his children, but he's like, these, these kids, they suck. I'm just gonna kill them all. So he's gonna go in and wipe out his kids. Right? So think about worldview, okay? These are your gods, okay? This is what your god will, is like. They're fickle. They don't like you, they'll kill you. So he goes and he's like, I'm gonna kill all my kids. They're, they're threatening, they're trying to take over, they're populating, I don't like them, I'm gonna get rid of them. And so Apsu goes and he's, gonna, he's planning with his wife Tiamat. Isn't that a great name? Tiamat. And so he and Tiamat are gonna plan this thing and then one of their children, Ea, who is the goddess of the earth, finds out. And she's like, what? Dad's gonna try to kill us? So she goes to her brothers and sisters, right? And she said, it basically tells a plan. Dad's going to kill us. So what do they do? They rise up, particularly this guy right here, Marduk, rises up, and they kill Apsu, their father. Wow, this is called what? Creation and conflict. This is all the deities in conflict, constantly fighting one another, right? You'll see this in Greek mythology, Roman mythology. So then Tiamat, the mom, she's not happy. She is the goddess of wind. The, okay? So in the beginning, the spirit was hovering over the waters, right? There was void and chaos, right? There's similarities. Yeah. See, Tiamat is the goddess of wind and water. Hmm. And the spirit was hovering. Spirit or wind is what the Hebrew word is for the spirit, right? Ruach, right? It even sounds like breathing, ruach. Right? <laughs> Some people think the name Yahweh is the sound of breathing. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. So Marduk, right, he just killed his dad. So Tiamat rises up with this guy named Kingu, right? Kingu. <laughs> King Kong, Kingu. So, so they're going to wage war against Marduk and Ea and the rest of the brothers and sisters. And so Marduk gets into a battle with his mom, Tiamat. And what does Marduk do? He splits Tiamat in half because she was opening her mouth to breathe out wind and also to swallow him. And then when she's doing that, he splits her in half. He uses one part of her body. Remember, one of the repeated words in Genesis is one is separate. So he separates mom. Half of mom he uses to create the earth and half of mom he uses to create the sky. And then he kills Kingu Right? This defeated warrior, and what does he do? He takes his blood, and then he puts it into clay and forms humans. That's very similar. And you're like, oh my god, is the Bible, did it copy from these other ancient texts? All sorts of crazy questions are running through your mind. Is, forget it, I'm going home, this is all junk, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me tell you something, okay? God always works in ways that you and I understand. He doesn't use things, you don't talk calculus to a two-year-old, right? You don't talk, you know, quantum mechanics to a seventh grader. What do you talk to a seventh grader? History, English, and read whatever that book is you need to read, right? God always talks to us in ways we understand. That's how the eternal God connects with finite person. Always uses things that we know. He doesn't use things that we don't know. So when you get to the book of Deuteronomy, what is the, book, what is the structure of the book of Deuteronomy? It actually fo follows the structure of a Hittite treaty. Right? You're like, what? I thought Deuteronomy was written all by himself. These people don't live in bubbles. You know, they don't live around with little bubbles around themselves, right? Of course, they interact with culture and society. And always use this. And you've seen this in your own life. How the things that you've done, God uses that to speak to you. And it has a specific message to you. <coughs> and it's meaningful, right? And this is what I don't think. So the question is, is who came first? Who, who wrote what first? It's okay. You could open that. I don't mind. Who, who came first? Raise it up high and <laughs> raise that sucker and open it. It's fine. You know, 
what came first? The biblical narrative came first or the ancient narr narr narrative came first? Doesn't really matter, yeah. honestly. Right. Doesn't really matter. Because part of what God's doing when he gives this new story, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, which I love. I, I just absolutely love Leviticus. If you guys don't like it, it's too bad for you. <laughs> Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? I just lost my train of thought because I was just ranting on Leviticus. So we move on. It's okay. So that's kind of what I want you to understand. The correction of worldview. Right? What kind of a world is it when if I don't worship the Nile God, if I, you know, if I don't give the right sacrifice to this God, if I don't appease this God, they're going to retaliate and they're going to kill me. If they're not willing, if they're not, you know, shy about killing one another, they're definitely not going to be shy about killing me. And it's that fear, right? One of the things that I think that has really happened to everybody in DTS is what? That you're freed from fear. Right? Fear will rule your life, dominate you. Right? And that's what slavery is when we get to Exodus. Domination. And you cannot be human, right? But we become dehumanized in slavery. Right? So this is definitely the revolution that God wants to create in, in, in the original hearer's mind, original reader's mind, and then also in your mind. Remember, the Bible was not written to us. But it was definitely written for us, right? So in order to understand what was written to us, we actually have to understand who the original readers and hearers were, okay? Any questions on this? I know there's a lot of information. It's good, it's good stuff. Thank you. Really good. Yes, uh, yes. Did Abraham grow up worshiping like, the Mesopotamian? Oh, bless you, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Read Acts, read Joshua. Okay. And it'll say, Abraham served other gods. Is, is Mesopotamia the same as Babylon? Yes. Okay. It's a, it's a, Mesopotamia is more of a region, yeah. right? It's kind of like the United States. We're 50 states, but we're kind of united under United States of America. But you have Tennessee and Kentucky and Arkansas and the rest, right? Yeah, it's a region. Babylon ultimately comes later, and they basically usurp the whole thing. Yeah, good question. I have 15 minutes. Oh my god. Oh shoot, I have two pages to take you through. Okay. Um, what I kind of want to talk to you about is, let's, with, with the background in mind, okay, let's start talking about the original hearers and the original readers. Okay, now who are the original hearers? Name some names for me. Who's hearing God? Abraham. Everybody always says Abraham. Isaac. Isaac doesn't hear very much from God, though. Right. Yeah. Huh? The serpent. The serpent, yes! <laughs> he is an original hearer. That's brilliant. Adam, Adam. Yes, Adam and Eve. Okay, so these people are original hearers. The question you always have to ask is, what is God wanting to teach the original hearers? Yeah. When you consider that, then the next question begins, becomes, who are the original readers? What should the readers, the people who are actually reading this text, when, okay, they didn't actually read, they can't read. When they heard the text, they had to read it out loud, right? That's why every year the leader or the king would have to read this out loud. Deuteronomy 17, okay? You'll get there when you get to Deuteronomy. So the people who are hearing, as they think about the original hearers, the same truth that holds true for the original hearers is the same truth that holds for the original readers, is the same truth that holds for you. See, this is why it's important to understand what exactly is God trying to teach them. And I'm going to do my best to try to take you through the journey of discovery as my mouth is becoming super dry. So the original hearers we'll talk about as we go through the text. Original readers. There are kind of two groups. It's the first generation of people who were brought out of Egypt. Okay, so they are the generation of slaves. Okay, they, are, they are probably going to be the, the biggest whining generation you'll read in the Bible. They're a bunch of whiners, right? What I would like you to consider as you read through the Pentateuch, don't judge them. Okay? Don't judge them. You're going to be really tempted to. Stupid Israelites. You're going to say that over and over again. Don't. Why? Because their story is our story. Okay? 
We are just as dumb and stubborn and rebellious. We are just as much of whiners and complainers as they are, okay? You know, oh God, why do you want me to go to Kona? I don't want to go to Kona. Why am I here first week? I hate it here. I have no friends. God doesn't know what he's doing. Blah, 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 right? We're just as much as whiners. I don't like my teammate. I don't like my roommate. I don't like my school leader. I don't like anybody, right? Why did you send me here, God? Who do you sound like? Just like the first generation of Hebrews, okay? But don't, don't be tempted. You can be tempted, but don't, don't succumb. You have to understand that God understands that about them. He says that they couldn't believe because of the harsh servitude of slavery. God knows that. Right? He understands. These people, slave mentality. Right? Have you ever seen somebody who has been so beaten down in life, so crushed, yeah. that they're more animal than they are human? Right? Let me read you a story, okay? <clears throat> Every time I read this story, I like cry uncontrollably. So if I start crying, I'm like looking for a napkin already. <laughs> Please forgive me, okay? I've tried to read this so many times that I like get used to it and I won't like break down. Doesn't work. I'm just gonna read it to you. If you've read it, if you've heard the story before, just listen to it again, okay? I like telling stories. It's a story, it's, a, it's from a book called uh, Seven Laws of the Learner. If you ever do the Titus Project, you'll have to read this book, okay? <clears throat> so Seven Laws of the Learner, it's about a boy named Teddy Stallard. So let me read it, okay? I'm trying to explain slave mentality. Okay. Teddy Stallard, certainly qualified as one of the least. Disinterested in school, he wore musty and wrinkled clothes. Hair was never combed. He was one of those kids with a deadpan face, expressionless, right? Sort of a glassy, unfocused stare. I don't see any of those glassy, unfocused stares in this room. You guys are like knives. <laughs> knives are coming out of your eyes at me, right? When Ms. Thompson, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I can use them. You're gonna cry too. No, I'm joking. No, you won't, you won't cry. I'm just, I'm just sappy, that's why. Ms. Thompson often spoke to Teddy. Oh, when Ms. Ms. Thompson spoke to Teddy, he always answered in monosyllables. Yes, no, maybe, right? He was unattractive, unmotivated, and distant. He was just plain hard to like, okay? And I'm sure you know people like this, or perhaps you were once like this in your life, right? I was definitely like this in my life. Even though his teacher said she loved all her class the same, she knew she wasn't being completely truthful. Whenever she marked Teddy's papers, she got a certain perverse sense from putting X's next to the wrong answers, and when she put F's at the top of, her, of the papers, she always did it with a flair. F, fail, right? She should have known better. She had Teddy's records, and she knew more about him than she wanted to admit. The record reads, first grade, Teddy shows promise with his work and attitude, but poor home situation. Second grade, Teddy could do better. Mother is seriously ill. He receives little help at home. Third grade, Teddy is a good boy, but too serious. He is a slow learner. His mother died this year. Fourth grade, Teddy is very slow, but well behaved. His father shows no interest. Christmas came and the boys and girls in Ms. Thompson's class brought her Christmas presents. They piled her presents on her desk and crowded around to watch her open them. Among the presents, there was one from Teddy Stowler. She was surprised that he had brought her a gift. Teddy's gift was wrapped in brown paper, held together with scotch tape. On the paper was, were written the simple words, for Miss Thompson from Teddy. When she opened Teddy's present, it out fell a gaudy rhinestone bracelet, right? And half the stones were missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. The other boys and girls began to giggle and smirk over Teddy's gifts, but Miss Thompson at least had enough sense to silence them by immediately putting on the bracelet and putting some of the perfume on her wrist. Holding her wrist out for the other children to smell, she said, doesn't it smell lovely? Right? And the children, taking their cue from the teacher, readily agreed. At the end of the day, 
When the school was over and the other children had left, Teddy lingered behind. He slowly came over to her desk and said softly, Miss Thompson, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's because I loved my mom that much. And her bracelet looks really pretty on you. I'm glad you liked my presents. Right? When Teddy left, Miss Thompson got down on her knees and asked God to forgive her. The next day, when the children came to school, they were welcomed by a new teacher. Ms. Thompson had become a different person. She was no longer just a teacher, she had become an agent of God. This is gonna be a very important thing, okay? She had become an agent of God. She was now a person committed to loving her children and doing things for them that would live on after her. Toledoth, generations. She helped all the children, but especially the slow ones, and especially Teddy Staller. By the end of that school year, Teddy showed dramatic improvement. He had caught up with most of the students and was even ahead of some. She didn't hear from Teddy for a long time. Then one day, she received a note that read, okay, this is where I kind of lose it. <laughs> Dear Ms. Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know I will be graduating second in my class. Love, Teddy Stallard. Four years later, another note came, Dear Ms. Thompson, they just told me I will be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to be the first to know the university has not been easy, but I like it. Love, Teddy Stallard. Today is Jefferson's birthday, my phone tells me, okay. Four years later, Dear Ms. Thompson, as of today, oh, I am Theodore Stallard, MD. How about that? I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting married next month, the 27th. I want you to come and sit where my mother would sit if she were alive. You are the only family I have now. Dad died last year. It's okay to cry. <laughs> Love Teddy Stallard. Ms. Thompson went to that wedding and sat where Teddy's mother would have sat. She deserved to sit there. She had done something for Teddy that he could never forget. See, this is the generations. This is what legacy we leave, right? What can you give as a gift, my fellow teacher? You guys are all teachers. Instead of giving something that money can buy, risk giving something that will live on long after you. So why do I tell the story of Teddy Stallard? This is what God is doing to Israel. I'm broken, I'm a slave, right? Pharaoh is all that matters, right? We're just slaves, we're just trying to live day to day, poor, no sense of self, no worth. And what does God do? With an incredible miracle we'll study in Exodus, he brings them out. Not only does he bring them out, he forms them as a nation and says, you are mine. You belong to me. And he begins to instill in them a new vision of self. Not just a humanistic, oh, if we try hard enough, we can become whatever we want kind of humanism, but a, you were created in my image and in my likeness, identity, right? It's God believing in Israel. This is what the book of Genesis is about. This is what the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, with all of the moaning and the groaning and the whining that Israel does. God faithfully stays with them and he's forming a nation into his image and likeness. This is why Genesis is such an important book. Most of the theology that you learn, if you ever get a chance to go to seminary or do your SBS, most of the theology that you learn will be based out of what is formed in Genesis because it's a book of beginnings. So the second generation, they learn. Whatever it is that God wanted them to teach, learn, they learn because what happens? They are the most faithful, one of the most faithful generations in all of Israel's history. 40 years in the wilderness as they watch their parents, their uncles and their brothers pass away in the wilderness, they're learning something so that when they finally come to the borders of Canaan, they're like, let's do this thing. Let's go in, let's kick some Canaanite butt, okay? 
Now, the whole question of murdering the Canaanites in battle and 